Welcome to the Never Been Promoted Podcast with Thomas Helfrich. Get ready for a thrilling adventure as we uncover entrepreneurial journeys and life-changing business insights every week. And now your host, Thomas. Welcome to another episode of Never Been Promoted. Hi, I'm your host, Thomas Helfrich. I am here to help you kind of cut that tide, all the stuff out there that you hold on to that hold you back, the people, the things, you know, the excuses you make and these fears you hold on to for some reason. Um, I want to help you cut that tide to unleash your entrepreneur. Uh, you know, why is it called Never Been Promoted? I, I sometimes skip this. I've just never been promoted in my life. Um, but we do try to promote our guests as, uh, as, as much as possible. Uh, if you know, if you're here for the first time, you know, thanks for coming by. I really hope you you know listen again. And if you've been here before, thanks for listening. Uh, we're going to meet our, our guest, Sean Ryan, who's the co-founder of Rotary Digital. We'll get into that name a little bit. Uh, but before we do, let's take a moment. If, and if you've liked the podcast or it's it's something you've enjoyed, you know, go go to the Apple, go to uh the app, the Apple Podcast site, or, or Spotify, or whatever your favorite player is, and give it a really good review. This really means a lot for the community um, and our mission to help a million entrepreneurs get better at entrepreneurship. I appreciate it. Give the YouTube channel a uh, follow as well at youtube.com at Never Been Promoted. But enough shameless plugs. Let's bring in um Sean Ryan, co-founder of Rotary Digital. Rotary. Yeah, Sean that's Howard. right. That's right. Thanks ca- for me. calling in from your beach house, which means, you guys, mm-hmm. this guy is. Super successful sure. and uh, super <laughs> successful. Probably drives a Lamborghini or a minivan. One yeah, of the yeah, two. That's right. that's right. Did drive a minivan before. That's true. Never a Lamborghini. Had my I've minivan. A Lamborghini. Oh, so it's it's, it's 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 rotary or rotary? Let's go through it's that. Rotary. It's rotary. It's rotary. Uh, the idea it. when we started the company was um, we wanted to come up with like an old school sort of sounding name. So uh, and. Giving a little secret, uh, most of what is created around the company uh, is based off of uh, songs from the Black Keys, uh, which is one of my favorite bands. But uh, yeah. hopefully they're not upset about that. So that's part of it, too. It's uh, I think I've seen them. I didn't realize Black I was Keys? seeing them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen them many times. I, I so, think I saw them. I don't remember for sure. But I was told I was at that concert. Let's just leave it at that. Oh, wow. You must have had a fun time if you don't remember. I did. They said I had a great time and ordered a lot of Taco Bell. After, <laughs> yeah, that's um, right years ago yeah i think it was like literally i think we, we that that night the taco bill and the drive through was over 300 dollars. just wow that, like, all like right you had, a really, you had a really fun time we had That's a really cool. good time and, and i remember you know and my one of my best friend who was who was driving ordered him he ordered all this taco bell and they're like okay go and pull through and he's like no that was just for me it was like a it was like 100 bucks and That's we're awesome. like let's just go with it let's each of us That's order awesome. like a hundred dollars for the taco bell just because the you know so yeah, why not that's what it's for right late night right. sure if, okay, so here's that's a good icebreaker question before we get into you know to what you're yeah. doing here a little bit. Um, what's probably the worst piece of advice anyone's ever given you? Whoa, the worst piece of advice where they were like, "You got to do this," and you're like, "This is absolutely the worst piece of advice I've ever heard." And they were serious, like that would help you, not like the the, the playful like order a hundred dollars worth of Taco Bell kind of. Um, I don't remember, but I could flip it a little bit here, maybe if you don't mind. Um, when I was, I'll try to keep this short because I don't want to make it too long. When I, I went to college, really only went to college because uh, my friends went. I had terrible grades. I uh, stumbled through college, played tennis in college. Um, that was kind of the key reason I was there. Coming out, um, I was teaching tennis for a living. And then um, uh I winded up getting my first sales job. It was in Philadelphia. Literally was working for a magazine. Uh, the idea was that I would go up and down the road and like ask people to buy $200 ads in the back of the magazine. And um, after a while, um, through uh, just a, a range of circumstances, I got a job in New York. And when I got the job in New York, I went to the guy that I was working for. And uh, when I told him that I was going to be working in, in New York, uh, he looked at me dead in the eye and said, you'll never make it. So um, that probably, I don't want to call that advice, but that was motivation. So that was motivation for me to go to New York and stay there until I figured it out. Um, but I'm going to say that that's probably the the sort of uh, kind of indirect answer to your question. I think that's a good motivator. I mean, like yeah. the, the person you're kind of like spiteful towards, it gives you the initial push. Oh, yeah. For sure. I remember his name. I know. I mean, I, I, and I had, I had very little focus to that point. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I was just trying to figure it out. And he gave me absolute zero focus, not necessarily on what I was going to do, but that I wasn't going to come back from New York. I was going to figure out how to make it work. 
for sure. Yeah. Did you look at him and go, or, or I'll say it differently. Have you ever driven by his apartment and just sat there? No, but I've like looked him up a few times online to see where he was. I think he's passed. Obviously he's passed away now. He was older at the time, but there were times during the, during my career where I would look him up and just sort of remind myself uh, that happened for a while, but you know, you get to, you get to a certain point where like, okay, I've proven it. Uh, now it's more about me and less about him. But like in the beginning, it, it definitely was. It was, it was quite a little bit about him. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's funny. He may have been projecting a bit. Yeah, maybe. That's right. I'm sure he was. That's I'm going right. to go with that. I don't even know the guy. I don't even like yeah. him. You know what? God you know what? That's right. But you know, um, maybe okay. he was trying to motivate me. Who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe he knew exactly. So, you know, the, the role of like a parent, right, is not to tell you what you need to hear. It's to tell you what you need, need to hear, not what you want to hear. So yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. Like, this guy needs to hear that. So he gets off his ass and actually could, shows us. Could have been, right? I never asked him, right? Maybe if I'd gone back to him years later and said, like, why'd you say that? He might have told me that. Well, then, I knew you'd make it. I just needed to get you off your ass. You're a tennis yeah. player. If someone tells you you can't hit a cross court backhand while running full speed, you sure as hell you're going to go out there and do it. I sure That's right. That's right. That's a good All right. Point. Two hands on backhand or one? Uh, one. Um, yep. Yeah, um, two could never do it. Uh, just uh, didn't have the reach, didn't have the sort of the range, but pretty good one hand backhand. Yeah, not bad. Not that we're going to get, I, I, I played racquetball. Well, let's get into it. We can get into whatever we're, you want. So, so, so I was a racquetball player growing up, like a competitive okay. national, like didn't, didn't go pro, didn't see the money value. You, probably you were like before. nationally ranked in racquetball? I have a world title in juniors for doubles. Yes. Whoa. I, yeah, yeah, I was on the US, the junior national team years ago. Only, sorry, only racquetball or did you play uh, any other racket sports? Squash for fun. Squash. I did too. Tennis, tennis and racquetball don't go because tennis, you go kind of low to high. Yeah, racquetball you high to low with no spin or very very okay. like a specific spin for the shot. Yeah. Uh, so when you racquetball player becomes a tennis, tries to do tennis, they have mechanics. They're doing the things they do. No, no chance for a two-handed background if if you're from racquetball. Like that's not even. Oh, yes. I, even I, I get it, and I feel like a wet noodle. I'm like I have no idea what to do here. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you that um, occasionally, what I didn't like about tennis is you go out there with maybe three to four balls. If you found maybe an extra one laying around. And guaranteed within seven minutes, one ball has been launched into the forest and or lake and or parking lot because you're like, ah, oh, here's the confidence. And you're like, you just you go back to your swing and boom, there's no spin. Yeah. But that thing is to the moon. Well, yeah. You don't mean to. It looks yeah. intentional, but it's not. But I could see you taking sort of that flat down to high to low sort of swing and trying to make that work on a tennis court. Uh, on a tennis court, though, I will tell you, when I did serve. Yeah, it was difficult to return even for good players because like there's like no spin on the ball and it's coming in flat yeah. as you get and it's yeah, like, sure. right, and there's sure. power there, right? So that was kind of fun. That's so cool. I definitely tried. You know, like I said, I grew up playing tennis through college. I tried squash is amazing. Uh, just how difficult it is. Like players at the top level, I never saw a top level racquetball. I'm sure it's amazing too. So it would have been fun to see you play. You, you know, yeah, the, assumption, the assumption is in racquetball, you're not moving as much. And I know that's totally untrue. Oh, no. no. So the reason it never became a bigger sport, and we'll, we'll move on from this, is it moves so fast. The ball is going 150 to 180 miles per hour on a serve in a 40-foot yeah. court, of which you pick up at about 28 feet um, yeah. with left. So it, it, the speed is incredible. I mean, it's just it, there's an explosion sound, and then you're like, it's like on, it's unfilmable wow. <laughs> because it's too fast. Now, wait, last um, question. Do you still play? Um, I started playing again. Yeah. I'm just nice. a, I started playing tennis again. Same thing. Yeah. And I'm I'm yeah. like very cautious because your 18 year old mind is still there and you're like, I'm gonna break something. I played tennis yesterday and like I'm sore as anything today because you're you're right. You I still I still can hit a tennis ball like when I was 20, but I shouldn't be hitting a tennis ball like that because I'm not 20 anymore. But you you can't help it, right? Like you so you've been in the racquetball court. That's a good metaphor for um for pe- for marketing. Now, let's get into that just a bit. Um, yep. um I'm assuming Rotary Digital is a marketing agency. It is. But um, yeah. but the right. idea is if you get stuck in these kind of old ways and you're not adopting new tech, new processes, new ways people want to get interacted with, it no longer works. And I'm going to let me pause that and talk about because you said, you know, kind of had this old school idea. Talk about what you, you know, what you've created. Kind of give me the, the pitch on that and, and take me how you got there from tennis to 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 the, the agency. Uh, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, so we talked about how I, I got into New York. I was selling and advertising. I was working for a range of companies, you know, uh, ladies home journal. If anybody remembers that it was a huge magazine back in the day, Rolling Stone. Uh, I was big, you know, I was just basically an ad sales guy kind of going through that, uh, path, which we all would when you're in ad sales, right? You want to be an ad salesman, then you want to be a manager, then you want to be a publisher. 
but I realized when I became a manager that I didn't like it at all. I didn't like managing people. Uh, I liked, uh, maybe it's a control issue. I like the idea that I was hunting and killing my own things, right? So to have other people be responsible for that and for me to manage them, it just wasn't my thing. So long story short, about, uh, wow, 15 years ago. Um, and this is a key part of why this all worked too, was I decided that I didn't want to go into New York anymore. I was I was commuting three hours a day, 17 years. And I was like, how do I do this from home? And I decided at that time that I was going to try to be a consultant. And the two things that I realized right away were, number one, once I decided and I was committed to it, you're pretty amazed at how many people out there either do it or how many other companies out there would use your service. And I think a lot of the times for people that launch out on their own, they're too afraid that uh, there's not a need for it or they won't find enough people or they won't make it work. Right. But once you really get your head in there, you find out that there's like a big community. So I started doing that. I started working commission only sales so that I didn't have to commute every day into New York. And then uh, fast forward, I was working for a company uh, out of Philly called Cool Material, a website. And uh, it was owned by a guy by the name of Tim Jacobson, who's now my partner. And uh, it was this really great site that um, offered this great platform for direct to consumer companies. And they were companies that were spending just a couple thousand dollars an ad, but it was really refreshing because. Um, it changed from how I was doing business before, which was I was basically working with agencies and I was going after six, seven figure uh, agency RFPs. Uh, and sometimes you win them, sometimes you don't. But it's a it's a really difficult process. We could spend hours talking about it. Yeah. And I didn't want to do that anymore. So uh, working for working for Cool Material and Sim was great. I was talking to clients directly and they were deciding like on the phone or on email, like, hey, you want to run an ad? They say, sure, we'll try it. And that's how it was. So it was just went back to how advertising used to be, almost like when I first started. Anyway, the company only had two ad units. And so because direct-to-consumer ads want to run around the holidays, I was turning away advertisers the whole time. And being a commission-only sales guy, I was like, I don't want to do that. I'm not making any money. So I was like, well, what else can I do to try to capture some of this money still? And I started talking to some of the brands. And they said, uh, I said, where else do you run to reach men? And they said newsletters. And this was in 2016. And I was like, people read newsletters? Like, I didn't even think that was a thing anymore. Funny enough today, right? right. So we decided to launch uh, a newsletter that would essentially be a way for us to generate uh, more ad revenue. So we would launch a newsletter that would complement Cool Material. And uh, the first one was Elevator, uh, which is what we own. It's a general entertainment newsletter. All of our newsletters are really simple. We curate the content. Um, we curate four to five articles. We curate two images and one ad unit. And it's all curated by my partner, Tim and I. And the idea is that we're, uh, I don't know, obnoxious enough to think that whatever we like, other people would like. And that's kind of the philosophy of it. There's only two things that we don't do in the newsletters. We don't put anything in there related to news or anything negative because uh, you can get that anywhere. Isn't so, that the same thing? News, negative? Yeah, it is. It, it used totally to be like is. news used to be like good news, yeah, gospel, yeah. and now it's moved to negative news. Oh man, you're hundred percent right. And again, you want to have another podcast about why I could, you know, we could talk all day about that. You can go down that so, road. Um, yeah. So that's what we started. So we started elevator and uh, we grew it pretty quickly and then we spun it into its own company. Uh, and Tim and I started that company together. And then we basically were having a lot of success with that newsletter. And then we decided to launch three other ones. So we have another one called shift, which is a wellness travel one for men. Then we have another one called Jimmy, which is about sex, dating, and relationships for men. And then we have another one called Blazer, which is a fashion one for men. And the idea was like, how do you grow scale through niche, right? We create these sort of niche brands for uh, the direct-to-consumer marketers that we want to work with. And we keep it at a price point where I can talk to them directly and I don't have to deal with agencies. This is a general rule. And try to achieve scale through multiple products. And that's kind of where we are today. So um, the company's, again, called Rotary. And we have four emails uh, and they reach about one and a half million men per day. Um, and it's wow. to answer your question, we're very specific in that we're like, I always use this analogy of uh, a coffee shop, right? I never set out to be Starbucks. I just wanted to be a really cool corner coffee shop. And so that's what we continue to try to do. We've never made decisions to be something that we're not. And we recognize that we're small and niche, but we've been able to build a, a good enough business where it's. Tim and I do well, and we have four other great people that work for us. And so we have a nice small business that's nimble 
Um, um, you know, it has its challenges, but uh, overall, it's a way for us to sort of maintain that kind of niche mentality. You make a really good point there. So you can, um, and I was taking a note on this, is that you, you talked about when people first start, uh, and, and I'll even just narrow that down to like really a marketing agency, because it's, it's where kind of like all careers go to, to do your own business first. <laughs> it's like, oh, I think I can market because my market yeah. was like, uh, you, you're the niching down. So you've taken it from not only like, Hey, I'm not doing all this stuff. We've got newsletters, we got, ad, and it's to men. And, yeah. and, and it's not like a sexist thing. It's not something else. It's, it's like, that's just what you do well. And, and you're hitting products and services that want to cater to men. Yep. Um, now that can be interpreted lots of ways by people like, Oh, you don't work with, you know, I'd work with a woman as long as she's trying to contact men and her product. Right. 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 And, and I think that's different than some people going, Hey, I help men do this. But, but then there's another customer we have that says, I help divorce men, you know, kind of launch their, their next phase because he's been <laughs> through it. And, and I go, that's a very specific thing because that person probably actually wants not to work with um, a female at that point. So anyway, it's interesting when you niche down and something you said earlier is that someone's going to need that. I think the trick is not bending off of it is staying committed and focused yeah. to that niche. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll take a pause. I know we went through this when I was like, we, we first started our agency a few years ago and I was like, we kind of did too much, not kind of, we did too much and too much too fast. And, and now we're like, Hey, LinkedIn, you want to rock LinkedIn, you work with us, period. Like that's what we do. And, and us only <laughs> it's like, kind of we maybe go to Canada yep. and that's a hard thing to make a transition to. But once you do, you become known for it. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit, that focus? And if you've ever had some moments where like, maybe we should, and then you go, no, 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 no. And you pull it back in. Like, oh yeah. You have a Coke banner. So it's not like you can just make the decision. Like, like you have to, yeah, you, you start. Cause I, I think I have lots more questions in this space. Yeah. So we were very deliberate to be, well, first of all, cool material. Tim's company was only targeting men. So when we spun out uh, Rotary to complement that, we wanted to continue to reach men. And in marketing and advertising, uh, you know, the more narrow and niche your focus is, the better story you can tell and the better you can sell what you do and create that connection with, with marketers. Now, um, you know, I think, let's say, I mean, I, I think that if, I, if we were 20 years younger, we probably would have been sort of drunk with like the initial success and said like, oh, we could make this bigger and broader. But I've always been very, very deliberate because I know if I try to reach only upscale men and I keep it at a certain price level, that there's a good range of customers that I can work with. But the minute that I try to become bigger and broader, you open up what we offer to the internet universe, which is like, there are a thousand different ways to buy men at scale, if you think about it, right? Whether they're good or not, there are a thousand different ways. But with us, we're very specific. We have uh, one and a half million subscribers. They, you know, they, they obviously take specific action to subscribe to our newsletters. They're extremely loyal. They're first party. Um, so, you know, it's a very valuable audience for us. But we do recognize that when you make the decision to be niche, you also have to accept that there's, you know, a bit of a ceiling. And that's what we focus on now, right? I have many marketers that work with us that say, hey, look, if I'm trying to reach upscale men, uh, I come to you guys, I spend and I do great. But if I need to reach, you know, five times that amount, I've got to go to Facebook or I've got to go somewhere else. So our challenge is once we've had success with brands, how do you keep them? And some of the brands that are a bit larger. How do you uh, convince them that we're still a valuable platform for them, even if they're using something bigger? But to answer your question, you know, it, it, it allows us to be very focused. It allows us to really focus on what we do best. Um, and it allows us, you know, as a company, we are very much sort of like a dollar in, dollar out. So we're not going to spend untold amount of money on something that we don't think we know is going to work uh, because that's just not where we're at at this stage in our careers. So that allows us, again, from a financial standpoint, to be very focused as well, too. And, you know, in the end, we really focus on just being really good in our niche. We provide even better value for all the brands that we work with. Um, and that's, that's I think that's what's happened, you know, knock on wood. Yeah, well, I mean, it's great. And uh, any any like really flagship type of like success stories and not even some maybe like a I was like a big one but also like the small one who didn't think it would work because like those are the ones like you're like put enough money and time and it'll you'll get it done but like you get the one who's like hey listen I have you know you know they have limited budget you know you're under the pressure to get it done you know that's going to impact them if it doesn't do, do you have a cool story like like that yeah I mean we you know we we basically close um in theory, a hundred ads a month, which is kind of crazy, but we do. Um, and we've had a lot of brands that have sort of initially weren't sure if they would 
work well with us. But um, I mean, the, the pro- there, there's a company that's worked with us since the very, very beginning that I think initially we weren't sure. Um, uh, actually, you know what? There's one company that's pretty fun that had, as far as I remember, he had never advertised before and I'd convinced him to try advertising for his brand. He was a former Levi's exec that works for a company called Dadgrass. I don't know if you guys know Dadgrass, but it's like a kind of a hemp company and uh, they have this really clever packaging. And uh, we, it was one of those times where I was on the phone with him and he was like, look, I've never done any marketing before for this. Not sure if it'll work. And I had had a long talk with him and convinced him that it could. And after that, he had great success. And then he winded up working with us and he still works with us to this day. So that was a pretty neat one. Um, but we have lots of ones like that, brands that are, because most of the brands in this category are new, right? They're just getting going. And then advertising is kind of a new thing for them. So a lot of the times, the great thing for us is that we have no special levers, right? So if you're a brand and you run with us, um, we forecast how many clicks we think you'll get. You pay a flat rate. We don't know on your end how well it converts. You let us know, but we can prove to you how many clicks we've delivered um, on our third party platform, our, our email service provider. And in the end, you'll let us know. So those relationships are great because, you know, we're confident in how many clicks we can deliver. And then when a client comes back and says, wow, that converted really well uh, and we continue to run with you, it's great. I would say 70 percent or more of our advertisers are, are repeat customers. So that tells you a lot, too, over the years. So uh, that's another good thing, too. So we focus on LinkedIn and instantly relevant for my agency. I can't advertise. No. At least using the words LinkedIn. You, you and, can't advertise on LinkedIn? Well, you can't use the word LinkedIn because Google flags it as, hey, you don't own the trademark. And SEO isn't a, isn't a play because LinkedIn's the top 700 things you'd say on LinkedIn. So we have our own system that we use for LinkedIn um, and train people on or do for them that basically how to use it correctly. And we just use that system itself to find people. Not super scalable, but it works. But in that case, what would you recommend from an advertising standpoint? Well, you can't use a trademark, but you're, you know, it's like a, you know, in that scenario, I would love to hear it because you might have a new client here. No pressure. Well, right. I mean, first of all, you're trying to reach entrepreneurs, right? So you're very specific, right? So LinkedIn would make a lot of sense, but there's also, you know, this is going to surprise you, Thomas. Obviously, I work in the newsletter space, right? So there, there are, there are a lot of, newsletters out there uh, that are um, specifically targeting founders of companies. There are organizations uh, that have a tremendous amount of, um, of um, exposure to founders of companies. I'm, I, I'm, this isn't a plug, but I'm part of it. I'm part of a group called Hamptons, started by Sam Parr from The Hustle. Um, and it's an organization that you have to interview to get into, but it's over 700 entrepreneurs, right? So imagine, Thomas, if you had the ability in some way to be able to get exposure to that uh, audience, right? That would be another way. But LinkedIn is a great place for you, but there are a lot of other ways that you can reach entrepreneurs through newsletters, through these uh, founders clubs that I think would be uh, just a, a prime target for you. Something maybe we could talk about offline if you want, but for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, um, listen, I'm in a, and, and I love these kind of conversations because, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about using newsletters, I'm okay having a conversation where people hear it. And the reason yeah. is not only do I get free consulting, which is the whole point of the podcast, so I can learn. Oh, yeah. Me, but also, uh, you know, you, you know, in my world, we have the agency, we have the podcast YouTube channel, but also a community I'm going to start this summer called Cut the Tie. Uh, and the idea is, 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 is that that is a no noise, no BS group of entrepreneurs helping each other or getting help. And so we're not thinking Facebook. We're thinking, hey, monthly kind of, you know, what do you want to learn about? What kind of speaker do you want? Let's find a live event together. Let's do one in person. And the reason is because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that I know I've met that want that. They want kind of a no noise peer group uh, that's everyone's paid to be there because there's no tire kickers. There's people that are serious about trying to get help or helping each other based on where they are. If I go to that newsletter and on is it through LinkedIn or are these outside newsletters that you would advertise with? So so take me through it because I would be interested of driving people who want to use LinkedIn to grow their business without like and our thing is without brand wrecking spam. Like we like we don't do it that way. We do it the right way. So you actually grow a good brand. What would you recommend? Well, two things. Would your let me ask you this. You have an expertise on how to build a successful brand off LinkedIn. That's fair to say, right? 100%. Yeah. 100%. And Sorry. actually, multiple brands, if you need to, of the like, where if you have so, to be yeah, so brand. There's two ways. So there's two ways. Number one, again, you could be, if you don't have one already, and apologize if I don't know this, but if you didn't have a community, a LinkedIn community or a, a newsletter community, 
you could be building one because every entrepreneur would want to read what you have to say about how to get more exposure on LinkedIn. LinkedIn's become the absolute sort of like main platform for most entrepreneurs to try to get exposure, right? It's for me. I I try all the time on LinkedIn. I, I could learn a ton from you. Like I'm, I post most days, but I know that if I'm trying to reach marketers and want to get them to better understand what we do or what our offering is, I need to do it on LinkedIn and I don't do it well. So I'm sure that if I hired you or I got your newsletter, I would learn a ton about that. Well, and so our newsletter, here, here's the good thing. So our newsletter for simplicity are the week's podcasts that are going out and we do a little LinkedIn tip. Oh, do you do that? Really? Do you look at newsletters and go, we can improve that. I would do this to help more impact. Like what's your kind of role when there's an existing newsletter in place? Well, I mean, that's what I would do for you. I would, I'm going to take a look at yours after this and apologies that I didn't see it before. But we just, it's funny, uh, by the way, I didn't interrupt you, but we happens all the time. Uh, I'm only, I'm only on social media in total an hour yeah. a week. Just believe oh, okay. We're not even connected on LinkedIn as of this podcast. I sent it to you this morning. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's good for you. What I would Taylor's say kids is, are naked, John. Taylor's kids are I'm going to look at that. I'm going to look at that newsletter later. And you, if by positioning yourself as an expert on LinkedIn, you would attract a tremendous amount of, of entrepreneurs. You know, like I said, um, you know, if you had the ability through a community you built or the, this, this great community Hamptons that I'm part of to be a part of, uh, that would be another way for you to get your message out by, by you basically um, positioning yourself as an expert on LinkedIn, which you can do because you've proven it, you know, that's going to be the best way for you to sort of market yourself and your podcast outside of LinkedIn for sure. It could be through a newsletter and it could be, and there's lots of ways for you to promote your newsletter to that community, which we can talk about offline, but there are lots of ways for you to reach entrepreneurs yeah. and not be. We'll definitely do that. Uh, yeah. And it's something that, like, you know, you have a newsletter, and we use it, it, it for just more brand awareness and for simplicity of content. That's why we do it too. It's like a malgeration of like, you know, bringing the podcast and everything else. And, and I think the reason I'm talking about this for entrepreneurs is that I don't even our newsletter doesn't have nearly, there's no real call to action except check out the the, the podcast and YouTube. The, the, as even I look at our, you know, cross brands of instantly relevant, never been promoted in what will be this community you still have to have a centralized place you're starting people based on yeah. where they are in their journey. And the newsletter, even for us, is not, it's there with the idea. That I think it could be more strategic. And I think a lot of people look at it as like, everyone has a newsletter. If you look in your inbox, there's 400. I, I joined so few newsletters. It's usually only customers. Um, even even like, you know, podcast guests, I don't join all their newsletters because I just don't, it, would, it actually hurts their metrics. So I'm not going to look at it. My personal profile yeah. is not. There's a few I will because I'm coaching them or we're doing whatever. So when I think when people are out there and they're thinking newsletters, I think they don't think about it as strategically as you're just signing. I'm, I'm hearing this going, I never even thought about it that way, where, you know, if you're out there all the time, that is the guy to go work with. If you're trying to, you know, raise your, we call it executive eminence, probably is badly branded, but we really help the founder or the guy that, or the woman or man who's running the, the, the million dollar, $5 million company become bigger than, because they want to do something more and they can't, they're strapped. They don't have the time for it. So we really, but that's like a, that's it. a, that's a, that's a, that's a great niche uh, for you to be an expert on LinkedIn because every entrepreneur needs to be on LinkedIn and needs to be doing more there. And LinkedIn has really changed now. When I was, when I first started on LinkedIn, right, Thomas, like the whole idea was it was like an exclusive network of the people that you knew. And it's not like that anymore. Like now it's just trying to get scale. So all the more reason that you could be extremely relevant for just a ton of people. So we could talk about it. And the last thing I'll tell you is the great thing about a good newsletter is like that can be your central point to sort of make, people aware of all the offerings that you have versus what it used to be, which was a website. But nowadays a website to try to build and grow and use SEO and try to maintain that it's become increasingly difficult and it's just going to get even worse with AI. Uh, so the idea that you can have a newsletter that has very specific subscribers around it, you can actually use that as your tool. And yeah, there are a lot of newsletters out there, but I don't know any of any newsletter that specifically that I would get in my inbox that says, okay, I'm going to read this today. So it's going to tell me how to get better on LinkedIn. So um, I absolutely think you have a good niche there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so don't be, and, and I would not, you know, I wouldn't be intimidated by the idea. There, there are a lot of newsletters out there. There's just not a lot of good ones. I mean, we, we face it too, right? We're lucky in that our newsletters are pretty unique. Uh, actually, they're very unique. And there's not really anything else there, there like that. But for sure, you know, there has been an explosion of newsletters because of Beehive and Substack and everywhere else. But I wouldn't let that deter you. You would, uh, you absolutely have a good niche here. How do you take the newsletter? Um, so, so here's another question. So I have a multi-brand challenge, right? I have Instantly Relevant. I'll probably have something else down the road. Is it better to brand it? I call it Never Been Promoted Newsletter because it's just an easy one. It's you know catchy. But is it better to then extrapolate people to a 
the Thomas Helfrich's newsletter that that talks about LinkedIn. It might talk about um, verified marketing agencies. It might talk about entrepreneurship. Is it better to bubble them out to something bigger? So stay very focused on the LinkedIn one about entrepreneurship, whatever else. But tell me about the strategy where you have more offerings in what you and, and you know what I mean like so like I feel like there's a bigger newsletter at play that because because I'm into different things than just this uh, podcast right and and that's what the the newsletter's around so I'd love to hear your strategy on that a little bit too because it, it's a bit um, I mean for, for for you I think you have a really good uh, starting point with LinkedIn I think that that can provide a lot of value but then you're talking to other entrepreneurs so I think you can use that newsletter to cross promote other opportunities that you have. And then you can also use that initial newsletter to gauge the interest from those entrepreneurs on the interest they would have in the other offerings that you have. And then that could detail, that, that will basically tell you like, hey, this is something that I can continue to include as part of the existing newsletter, or there's enough interest here, I could spin out another newsletter for sure. Uh, but I think I you, you have two newsletters on LinkedIn. I don't think I don't think you could. Is it, I probably should know that. Is no, no. But I'm also talking. Oh, sorry, Thomas. Yeah, you can have a LinkedIn newsletter. But I'm talking about you having a newsletter outside of LinkedIn that promotes. Yeah, that, well, that's what I'm saying. That that thing is what I was asking. We use LinkedIn as a starting point. Oh yeah, and and you bounce out to something bigger. Um, yeah, I got you. Okay. So you know, it's funny that we went off to get it, and I you may know this better than me. So I post uh, pretty regularly on LinkedIn with the, obviously the idea is everybody else to sort of grow your following, right? But I've been reluctant to start a newsletter on LinkedIn because I feel like I'm doing the same thing by just posting every day. Uh, and what different value am I giving by creating a quote unquote LinkedIn newsletter as opposed oh, yeah. to the post I that I do? That so I, I don't know the answer. You may tell me. Oh, I'm 100% the answer. So the, the difference is 100% delivery to their, in, to the, to their email. So the oh, email okay. that's associated with LinkedIn, it shows up in your email, like, hey, latest from this newsletter. And now you're in there in, 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 100% delivery from that follower base. So we have like 8,400 people or so on our newsletter. And, you know, entrepreneurs, it, it gets delivered. Now you do get unsub stuff like that if you do it too sure. often or whatever else they've signed up for. But, the, but the, that's guaranteed email delivery. Oh, yeah, we do too. Okay, so that's one good way to think. So then look, so considering that you want to be a LinkedIn expert, you start that on LinkedIn, right? But then once you start to see success from that and you want to spin out another newsletter, then I'll tell you like, oh, spin it out from use an email service provider like Beehive or use another one like uh, there are lots of email service providers out there or Substack or whatever you decide. Um, and you can spin out existing newsletters under that umbrella that aren't off LinkedIn that could be about other parts of your business if you want it. But it, it all depends. We can talk about it later. But I still think that most of what you do is probably fairly relevant for the same audience, I think, sounds like. So, yeah, it, um, the, the the podcaster may wait for me to meet entrepreneurs, get to know them a little bit, see if I yeah. want to bring them into what will be a community called Cut the Tie. Yeah. Because I, I, they seem trustworthy. They seem to know what they're talking about. Uh, and then the other flip side of that is uh, – is the is bringing them in if they need specifically for LinkedIn help or something else. So um, and I, I do focus a lot on the marketing agencies because uh, I believe that's the hardest part of being an entrepreneur is marketing and sales. Because like like oh, when yeah. you talk to people off camera, if you can't get people to know what you do and you can't sell them on the idea, it doesn't matter how good your processes are, your logos are, your business plan. It doesn't matter unless because revenue fixes pretty much everything. So. Creating I, I ideas and building out, that's the fun part. The, the not fun part is grinding out and getting people to, to buy what you have or to market what you have or to sell what you have. Like that's the part of the business that is the biggest struggle for most people. Like everybody likes to create things, but uh, it doesn't work unless you can, unless you can promote it, unless you can get, you have those conversations, you make those sales, right? Like, absolutely. So you're hundred percent right there. Yeah. But, and, uh, and the other part I think is off, and this, this is where I think some of the stuff from like, the ideas with cut the tie are, you know, is getting started. And so I yeah. think, you know, like if I look at where I'd want to niche as kind of an expert beyond just LinkedIn, which is a set of services, you know, you got like the Alex Hermoses, Gary V's, the world, everyone telling you all the things you need to do for lead generation, offer generation, like that's all there. I think one of the things I think I need to, I like to help people with is setting up the side hustle, getting out of the corporate world. How do I, how do I get going? How do I get the the momentum? Because that is honestly one of the hardest pieces is where to focus, how to focus, and how to get that niche repetition going while you're still working somewhere. Because so you that, just that, that's that. the niche I think I'm going to go tackle with Cut the Tie is because that is a very hard spot to be in. And it's a place where you still have money coming in and you want to, you just don't know how. So you just said something that is super interesting. And it's so important for not only, not for people like me, I've been around a long time, but for like younger people like my daughters who are just getting into the workforce, Everybody nowadays is thinking about a side hustle. 
right? Either I'm doing one or I should be doing one or how do I do one? And if you created something that would help people get started creating their side hustles and more importantly, which I think the biggest lesson is, it's like, don't be afraid to fail. Failing is the absolute best lesson you can ever have. So you try something that doesn't work, you try something else, right? And if you helped people better understand how to build out and start a side hustle, that's a tremendous, term. that's a Well, tremendous even more, so I think I'd narrow it down even further where it, it's like, I'm going to help you set, start a marketing side hustle. I don't know the other ones. I don't know B2C. Yeah. I don't know, I don't, or I don't know direct to customer. I don't know how to sell a product. I couldn't sell a product or a retail. I couldn't do that. CPG, not my stuff. Yeah. Um, but if you want to start a marketing agency, I can certainly help you focus there because because th there are skill sets you have or don't have, things you like to do or don't do, and that's going to really guide you to where you're going to end up after you've tried everything you shouldn't have. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that. I think that's a great idea. I mean, because if, if you went back, you were exactly where you were going to be. Now? Like you're, you're unlikely. You're like, you know what? If I do it again, I definitely would have gone fill in the blank, right? I would have gone, you know, high ticket coaching offer. You're like, no, you wouldn't have the experience back then. You never... Like you're, it's either in you to be like that or it's not. And so if you love doing yeah. websites and graphics, you better find value because you're commoditized right now with AI and Philippines and India. Yep. That's right. So, you know, so I, I think that's where I'll start with cut the tie from like a digital kind of experience group stuff. Um, most, most younger people aren't going to pay too much for coaching. Maybe I'm misassuming that, but I think, I think anyway, um, but a newsletter, I think when you do something like that, when you tie back some of the stuff you're doing, advertising in newsletters to get people to your newsletter is a strategy. You're saying it's a very effective one. Uh, yeah, for sure. We have, um, we, we, we do that a lot now. Uh, you know, again, unrelated to what you're going to try to do, but there are a lot of newsletters that promote themselves in our newsletter and that's how they drive subscribers as well too. Um, in fact, there are companies out there that have been really successful uh, that have used that as a big part of what they do. Like 1440, if you've ever heard of them, that's like a, mm -hmm. a, a news email. That was a big part of what he did in the beginning. I'm not sure if he does it as much now, but he was promoting all the time and he still does. So it's absolutely a great avenue. So same thing for you. It'd be on a smaller, more niche level, but there are a lot of newsletters or a lot of platforms out there where your idea around a marketing side hustle and or this podcast could be very relevant for sure. Yeah. Um, I like that word relevant. Could use. Yeah. It's very well sure. done. Well done. Um, all right. Let's, let me ask you a magic ball question. Someone comes oh, yeah. up to you. You're, you are the genie. Rubbed your, rubbed your little belly and little finger, mm -hmm. whatever you're in, and you've come out and you said, you, yours are going to say, here's my one piece of advice to do or not to do. What is it? Um, uh, it it's all about sticking to it. So it's all about the idea that um, once you are committed to an idea that you give it all of your attention and energy and you don't, um, you don't get taken back by failure. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. I think failure is such a great teacher. And I think for mo I could be wrong, but for most people that have ideas, really what holds them back is the lack of consistent effort. The idea that I'm going to keep doing this day in and day out. Um, one of my favorite, I'll tell you, this is just a sort of an offshoot, but it's actually like a great way to sort of think about it. I have an article. Um, it's called How to Stick with Good Daily Habits. It's by this guy, James Clear. And it was about this guy. He was a stockbroker. Um, and what he did was he was in, I think it was Arkansas. But basically, the, the article starts about how he was a stockbroker who had to make sales calls every day. And so what he did is he had a jar. He had a jar of 120 paper clips. And he would make a call. And he'd take one paper clip and he'd put it into the empty jar. And then he would do that until he was done. So he would make 120 calls every day. And what he did was, because he consistently did it day after day, it accrued and pretty soon he had a $5 million business. Pretty soon he had a $10 million business. I remember that when I read that article many years ago that I adopted the same thing, which was I actually own a $6 counter from Amazon and the counter basically sits by my desk. Yep. And what I do is I make 25, e well, it's emails mostly nowadays, it used to be calls, but it's emails nowadays where I, I ask for money. That's what I do. I ask clients for money and I do, I make 25 a day and my hope is that I can close a deal a day. Um, some days I don't, some days I close a couple, some days, sometimes I go for a few days where I, I, I don't get any, but generally because I do that consistently day in, day out, that has been the cornerstone and key to my success. So my biggest advice to anybody is just keep going after it consistently daily. And, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and that's, that's the key to success. There's no like magic bullet. You just got to do yeah. the work. Oh my God, we're gonna, we're gonna get into that in a minute. Um, oh my God, yeah. yeah I mean, we read so much about you know all these magic things that you can do to be successful, and it's not true. You just got to put in the work every single day. 
and yeah. and and define what that is for you. But make sure that each day that you put in the work and eventually like it builds. It just always builds. It either builds the right way or the wrong way. It builds and you start to truly see that you have success or something that's going to work or you learn pretty quickly that it doesn't and you pivot. But that's the only no, way. you No, can do it. no doubt. Uh, how do you want people to get a hold of you? I was like, you know, who, who do you want to get a hold of you? And how should they do that? Uh, I mean, I would love, you know, uh, obviously we, we have, we have four, we have four newsletters that reach a really great group of affluent men. So we're always interested in brands that uh, are looking to target men uh, that want to be in front of a really great, very loyal audience. So they can reach me at Sean at rotary digital.net. You have it right there. Um, S E A N at rotary digital.net. And uh, I'd love to talk to and, and share more details about what we do and, and how we can be a real benefit for, any kind of brand that's looking to try to grow the business. You know, you talked about something, uh, okay, sticking with it. And, and, and one of the philosophies we, we certainly do for, for LinkedIn is, you know, I say, like, just start with like the list, like 200 people that are, should be really good customers. And, and every month have a new 200 because you have the old 200. And the idea is that's 10 a day at the yeah. bare, like a bare minimum, start with 10 interactions a day and ask for nothing. And every day, some, some people reply. So your 10 is going to become a 15. And then it's going to be next thing you know, your 10 new, five, 10 replies. You're, you're starting to grow momentum. So over a year, there's 2,400 people you've potentially interacted with. Now you're about 100 or so a month that you're going to be really kind of back and forth with. And then your close rates go up because, they're, you know, if you've set up your profiles and all the things you do methodically, they know what you do and you've never asked for anything. And at some point you might want to grab a meeting with them and meet them. And I, and I teach it and it's surprising how many people fail at it because they don't do the consistency. They're in this AI um, instant gratification world. And what I find is a lot of Gen Xers are really good at it because they're kind of like droned out by the they, they feel the dopamine and the over stress of it. And they're like, you know, what, I, I'm just this isn't the. And, and the younger generation really straight out because they're, they're thinking in 90 days at most. And they're mm -hmm. not thinking like, hey, what am I going to be doing a year from now if I don't build this kind of piece? And so you're spot on with the resilience and stick with it and just methodically do it. Learn from the methodical pieces of it. Use AI maybe to record your conversations, right? Maybe how can I improve? How can I drive this to be more or less salesy, more of this? That we do that every 30 podcasts. I put them in, say, How can I improve the podcast? Kind of thing. So, anyway, my point is, um, you're spot on with that. You have to dopamine hit AI culture right now that we're in. Is uh, oof. So. I also think what the way that you have approached it, yeah, so that's similar to me. And I think another reason why it works so well is because I think most people think they have to be, I guess, for a lack of a better phrase, on for 24 hours, seven days a week. And that's not the case. So, if you define it the way that you're defining it, Thomas, this idea like reach out to 10 people a day. Like once you do it, then you eliminate that stress. Like, have I done enough or should I do more? Right. You have a consistent plan and each day you reach out. I mean, it's the same thing. Like I reach out, like I said, to 25 clients a day. And then I have no issue closing my laptop and saying I did the work today. Right. I did my work that I need to do today. I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow. And it just builds on itself. And that's that's we did the same thing. That's how I got my first ad and cool material. That's how I got my first ad at Rotary. And that's how we're at this point now where we get almost a hundred ads a month. It's the same philosophy. Um, I mean, if you, in, in, yeah, yeah, I mean, like we, you know, it changes a bit for the younger generation. They, you know, sales is sales is a bit more sort of like the nuanced and, and subjective, and it's not necessarily about setting up sequences and just putting automation out there. So you have to sort of figure out the balance, but it's just, again, like you said, the idea of just putting in daily work um, and, it is, and keeping at it. You know, my, my background's intelligent automation, AI, it, it wasn't marketing. So I, lo I look at how I can leverage technologies to accelerate me, not always replace, because some parts need to not be replaced, just accelerated. But even then, we don't do any real email marketing. And the reason is I find it spammy, and I don't know what I'd say in it to make it attractive, so we have to stay away from it. And I was like, if I don't know exactly what I want to do to add value in a sequence, I'm not going to do the sequence. That's yeah. my take on brand control and, and like, you know, you interact to me, it's authentic, and it's there. Harder to scale, but, but it doesn't mean you don't use it. But if you're not going to have an intent that doesn't align to what your brand is, don't. And that's why I tell people, because otherwise you're you're killing your target, your total addressable market. At some point, you'll figure it out and then you're going to crush it because you you've asked for little. You've done no. You've only given favors, not asked. So that's kind of the yeah, it's it, again, we got a whole podcast about this. Uh, you know, there's there's a there's a place for sequencing and we use it. Right. But if you use it the right way, that's fine. But if you're just using it to spam, you're using it the wrong way. And many people do that. I mean, how many times, how many emails do you get a day? Do you even realize you're getting a day that I get a day that are people reaching out to ask if they can work with me? And it has nothing to do with what my business is. 
So like, I don't even know how, what they assumed or how they got my name, but they'll, they'll basically provide a service that has absolutely nothing with what I do. And it's amazing. And you know, it's, 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 yeah. So it makes it tougher, right? Because then the people that we really want to talk to, they're getting so many emails that it makes it tougher to sort of break through, but that's always been a challenge. Yeah. 100% correct. I, and actually at this point I have an AI run my inbox. So, um, wow. And, and I'll give it to you if you like to afterwards, but it, it saves me nine, 10 hours a week. And I literally have me 30 emails, new ones a day that I need to look at. Um, and it's, oh, that's it. amazing. yeah, it's yeah tough I'll, I'll give it, it's, it's so it, it trains. It looks, how you use it, ask you questions and it, then it, it's awesome. It, it's it, funny. Um, that's a really interesting thing. I'd be interested to see if, you know, as a salesperson, like as well as AI can be, you just always are going to have those heart palpitations that they got it wrong. And there's an email you missed on somebody that wanted to run with you. Right. So you never know, but mine's different, right? Like I, I live in it because, you know, we're trying to like get trying to have conversations with people. I don't have as many inbounds coming into me as much as I'm the kind of I'm, I'm the outbound guy. Right. So uh, but it'd be interesting to see for sure. <laughs> I will definitely help you get the inbound that we'll talk about that. Uh, Sean, thank you so much. Once again, uh, best way to get a hold of you uh, as we as we uh, kind of say goodbye. Yeah, here, but, so uh, Sean, S-E-A-N at Rotary Digital dot net. Um, this was really fun. Uh, sounds like we can have a lot of good conversations uh, outside of this. Uh, happy to happy to have those. Thank you. Um, hang on one second. I'm going to say goodbye. Well, I'll bring you back in here. But thanks so much, Sean, for coming today. Uh, listen, if this is your first time here, thank you so much for making it here. And I hope it's the first of many. And if you've been here before, you rock. I sometimes give away dad points because I'm funny like that. Um, but you get dad points today, which means you can spend them anywhere. If you can figure that out, everyone in the world would like to know that, especially my kids. They have billions. Uh, Listen, I, I am on a mission to help entrepreneurs get better at entrepreneurship. I'm, I, you have to be able to cut these ties to things that hold you back, uh, things you presume, you know, the fears, the excuses, all the stuff you know you're doing. If you could do this by learning from the from the journey of our guests and others, uh, you're, you're going to do way better at it. Uh, check out Sean Ryan once again at Sean at Ro RotaryDigital.net or Rotary if you say it. I just keep wanting to say that, but Sean at Rotary or RotaryDigital.net uh, and, and make sure that you can... Uh, uh, see what he can do with newsletters for you. I know I'm going to have a conversation with him here in a moment about it as well. Tell me meet again, you know, get out there, unleash your entrepreneur. And thank you for listening to the Never Been Promoted podcast. Thanks for listening to Never Been Promoted with Thomas Helfrich. Make sure to check the show notes for our guest contact information and any relevant links. Connect with Thomas personally at neverbeenpromoted.com. Thanks again to instantlyrelevant.com for producing the show, all the social media, all the content, posts, articles, everything. Could not do it without you. Instantlyrelevant.com. Check it out. They're awesome. Once again, instantlyrelevant.com.